Hey guys, welcome to And The Writer Is. I'm your host, Ross Golan. I've written with hundreds of artists and writers over the years, and my favorite part of each session is the first hour when we catch up about life, the industry, politics, composition, whatever. So this is a journey of learning why people write songs, how people write songs, and most importantly, who the people are who write the songs. I'm producing this with the great Joe London, Big Deal Music Publishing, and Mega House Music Management. If you want to listen to the songs we discuss in this podcast, follow us on our socials, find out about special live events, or buy that merch, aka that hat I always wear. Go to our website, www.andthewriteris.com. Welcome to And The Writer Is. I am your host, Ross Golan. Today's entrepreneurial discoverer of talent is an artist, a music executive, an advocate, in addition to, oh, what's that called? A hit songwriter. Making waves from across the pond, she has scooped up Brit and Ivor Novello award nominations and is currently on the board of the latter. Her mastery of talent recognition was first exemplified by developing one of the United Kingdom's top-of-the-chart talents, Jess Glenn. This explains why she has now been bestowed the senior A&R position at one of the UK's biggest labels, Parlophone. Originally from Manchester, England, across the Atlantic Sea, she has proven she can do it all whilst still being creative. And the writer is Janae Bennett, a.k.a. Jin Jin. Hey! Hey! hey. <laughs> Thank it's you for having while. me. I haven't seen you. Uh, I we probably haven't seen each other for like five years or something. So long, yeah. I think it was where was it? Westlake, Westlake Studios in LA. Yeah, like a camp. classic. That classic. I mean, that <laughs> it's so cool when you get to work in studios. Where I mean, that's obviously I think it's the the off the wall for Michael Jackson kind of studio and stuff like that. Crazy. And then obviously uh, from the UK, coming over to LA to do writing sessions and then being in a studio like that, I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Like, I was so jet lagged. I was confused. Yeah, that's that's exactly the right time to uh, be in a session when you're not overthinking it and you're just, you're just spouting out things because yeah. you're probably like quietly exhausted and <laughs> emotional, you know? And they keep feeding you all those cookies. Oh my god! At the studio, there's cookies. Oh man, I'm so chubby right now. But that's beside <laughs> the point. Okay, so let's let's uh let's start from the beginning because um you know we don't have a ton of guests that were you know born in Manchester, England. Which although there are a lot of art centers in England, I I, I guess Manchester doesn't always seem to pop up as the first spot that you go to to become mm-hmm. an artist. It's mm-hmm. a super industrial town, so. Were your parents musicians? No, my um, father was actually um, was a football player, <laughs> played soccer. Sorry, you guys say soccer. And my mum, she's into music and she used to work part time for my granddad in his reggae music store. So I used to always hang out with my granddad and he used to play all these old school reggae tunes. And I suppose that was my first real introduction into music. But Manchester is super musical. Do you know, it's known for loads of indie bands. And um, also my parents used to tell me about... um, uh, dance electronic nightclub called the Hacienda so loads of like the electronic music used to come out of there and they used to always be playing house music in the house and reggae and hip-hop and Motown and stuff so so it was it music uh was any of that music from England it feels like that's all such uh international kind of music when I think of reggae I don't think of England yeah mm-hmm. I assume that that was you know island jamaican music that yeah. you're listening to mostly um and then same with house music i guess some of that can be in the uk but where yeah. where was music being generated from so all over really and i think it's because we had you know my grandparents moved over to the uk and you know ended up in manchester so there was like a huge caribbean community and they would wow. just make a community within the uk so the you know um yeah that was my first introduction why is there why why manchester manchester um i think um 
what happened was when my grandparents were coming over for work, my gran was a nurse, um, they flocked to the big cities. So it was either London, Manchester, Birmingham. And Manchester is like a huge city. It's like the third largest city in the UK. So Manchester, you know, just so happened to be the place that they, um, you know, settled and started a family. How old were you when you started actually singing? I think I was round about, I've, I've been always singing from like a toddler, but round about like seven, I was really getting into it. Poetry used to like write my own responses to songs that I heard on the radio. Like say if I heard like an R&B song or a hip hop song, I'd be like, okay, well, what would I write in a response to this? Like an Usher record or an old school reggae record. And I'd like write my own version <laughs> in response. That's like a, a really classic um, it, it's like a, a, a classic exercise for songwriters and so few songwriters actually do that when you're, when you're looking for something to write that's a, that's a really astute thing to do mm-hmm. did someone ever tell you to do that or you just inherently did that? Just inherently did it it was like especially when I was like hanging out in my granddad's um, record store I used to hear the reggae music and the rhythms um, and then I would just, sometimes I would even just write or write pop songs over them or or sing pop songs that I'd heard on the radio over the reggae beats. So kind of like my own little remixes <laughs> and just like experiment that way. But nobody ever told me to do it. I was just like, okay, cool. Look, maybe this idea will go with it and just took it from there. Did you write, you were saying you wrote poetry, but were you actually sort of, I guess at that point you're writing songs, wouldn't you, you know, were you, because you're singing along to stuff, right? Were yeah. You write, you yeah, so basically we started off with the poetry and I wouldn't do it to any backing track or music or whatever. I'd just write down things that would just come to my mind um, and then just made sure that, you know, the lines would rhyme and, you know, there was some sort of structure and then it turned into the songs after that. But I didn't really think it was a thing, you know, I didn't think songwriting was a thing that I could, that I was doing, if you know what I mean. I did, you know, at the time as well, when I'd listened to artists, I just assumed that all the artists wrote their own stuff as well. So I didn't know songwriting for somebody who wasn't an artist was actually a thing or could be a career. Well, at that point, did you think, I mean, you were only seven, so I guess yeah. <laughs> if you thought you were going to be an artist, but did mm-hmm. you aspire at that point already, like wanting to be on stage? Did you want to perform the songs? When I first started, I knew that I just loved to sing along pretty much, do you know, and it came to a point where, do you know, I was when I was young, I was super shy, do you know, and there was, I remember one time my mum um do you know, there was like this local like audition to, you know, to do something that came up. And then my mum brought me along to the audition and I was so shy that I didn't even want to go in. So then after that, my mum was like, wow, she's super shy. And, you know, I had, to, you know, didn't really want to interact with the other kids and stuff like that. So after that, she like was like, right, cool. We're going to find like a local like youth center or a dance class or something just so you can interact with other kids you know because I was just like painfully shy like to the point I would be like in tears like no no sort of thing so then I started going to these like weekend classes where you could like sing dance act and it was just like kind of like just hanging out with other people who other young kids who were into music and acting and just wanted to play sort of thing and hang out so then after that that's when I started you know getting into you know finding my confidence and then I was like singing as part of like a little choir and you know and then every time I would like get like a solo part of was just like one line I'd be like choke up and then be like oh no I can't do it I can't do it last minute so the build-up was like such a thing (laughs) do you still get stage fright yes definitely so that's why I was like wow I so can't be an artist (laughs) because I like the idea of bringing songs to life and I like the idea of like being able to dance and sing along to songs but then if I feel like all eyes are on me then it really just like yeah stops me in my tracks I mean you've released music though a lot of music as an artist still is it not not a lot (laughs) well I'm okay you, but you release some music as an yes, artist. But yeah. There's some part of you that really enjoys at least the recording part of it. 
To be quite honest, I, I like the idea of it, but then when it comes to it, even now, like as time's going on, even when I'm in the studio and somebody says, put some BVs down or can you do this, lay down some vocals, it really still makes me super nervous. So that's why all my sessions are, you know, with artists or with amazing vocalists. So even now I kind of like get sweaty palms and think like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And everyone's like, Jim. It's just a demo, it's fine. It's just an ooh, it's just a BV. <laughs> yeah, and you, can always, you can always delete it. I mean, exactly. that's a, it's not a different generation when it was to tape and, and each <laughs> roll pounds or whatever it would cost for, a, you know, or I guess 150 pounds to buy a, you know, a, yeah. a reel of tape. Like now it's just digital. It just Definitely. Just, You've got all the plugins. I'm like, right, come on, put Alter Boy on my voice. I need a foreman. Make me sound like a man. <laughs> I'm like, make me sound like Barry White. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So okay, so what gets you from, you know, you have this stage fright, you're in Manchester. Mm -hmm. What puts you into a place? I know you, you went to City College in Manchester, right? Yes, yeah. At this point, you knew you wanted to do music. On some level, right? Because it wasn't that. Well, didn't you study music there? Is that what it was? Yeah. So it was more. So basically, when I after stage school, I really liked acting and dancing, and you know the whole thing about performing and being around music, as it were. So when I left after that, and when I left school, I kind of like was a bit of in limbo because I was like, oh shit, I don't know what I'm going to do. I haven't applied for any colleges. I haven't. You know, my grades at school were okay, but now what? to do as a career um so then there was um I don't know I think it was my mum who told me about like courses that she had seen in the in the newspaper about um there was a music tech course um and then I had already enrolled to do like an acting like do acting at college but then when I went to the college I started you know did a couple of days at college and then realized that the acting that they were trying to teach you wasn't the same as what you saw on like tv or on, in the films it was like pretend to be a tree or pretend to be <laughs> and I was like um I don't know if I want to do this it's not the do you know what I mean like the acting that I knew and loved it was like the things that you see on the film do you know in film so I was like yeah I don't know if I want to pretend to be a tree today I don't think this is for me so I was like I kind of like dropped out of college then totally was in limbo didn't know what to do and it was my mum who had seen like a course that would like advertised in the newspaper saying about music tech and music business business and music you know just anything to do with music so then I went and it was really late and I finally managed to get onto this like part-time course it was like two days a week city college and it was music tech and you did loads of different things like um to do with music and I figured okay cool two days a week it's not too bad and then the other times you know I am um, the other three days that I wasn't in um, college, I worked part-time, like in a clothes shop. And I was like, yeah. And then if I work in a clothes shop, I can get free clothes. And then my life's set, you know, I can do a couple days at college to keep my mum happy. And then I've got all these nice fresh garms. So that's my life. <laughs> so yeah, it was from the music tech um, course that I kind of like got into it and I thought oh and then I discovered that there were other elements to the music business and to music as well. And that's when I got into production and into like little bits of songwriting and I was still doing that myself at home, you know, still just writing and trying to just network with people. So, um, yeah, that kind of like started me on my journey to, you know, get to be part of the music industry, as, as so it were. Would you write songs at home alone with no instrument did you play an instrument did you you know how would you write a song at home alone at that point so first of all i would play other backing tracks other songs that i'd heard on the radio and just hope to find a section of the <laughs> section of like the outro that just didn't have any singing on it um, and try and take that part and um use that or i would just um tinker around on like this really crappy like toy kind of keyboard <laughs> And, you know, it had all the letters, like, written on the, all the keys so I could remember because I was, like, you know, I'm not, you know, trained musically at all. But I kind of, like, would just teach myself basic chords that I could just play really slow along and then write over that. Um, yeah, so that's how I first started. That's what I would write to. Is music tech production and engineering or is music tech... Yeah. So, so you're actually learning before you really know how to even 
write songs professionally. Yeah. You're learning how to record it, right? Yeah. So it's kind of like it was. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I knew that this this music thing, music industry thing, seemed fun. I knew that I enjoyed listening to music, and I enjoyed that. I enjoyed singing along to it, and I enjoyed a bit of poetry as well. So I was like kind of like trying to buy myself some time by doing this course and then it just so happened that you learn other skills on this course as well so it was music production and you got to learn how to use the software then there was um you'd learn a bit about the business as well so the you know intellectual property and the legal side as well and then you would get to like do some performances and then the course as part of the course as well they would take you on these you know, take you away to like these music conventions. So we got to go to like um to Cannes um to Medem, which is like this um music convention that they do every year. So you get to, you know, learn about lots of different sides of the music industry. How much of that changed how you started writing? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that sort of each other at all you know when you start thinking oh this is how you record so i'm gonna write like this or this is intellectual you know i i remember somebody saying and i've, I've said this in a couple of interviews but i remember an a&r person who we're both friends with said uh um you you know i'm jealous of you guys because you guys can create an asset every day which is something you learn from when you start studying intellectual property that this is mm-hmm. property you know did studying that stuff at all affect you choosing to be a songwriter versus you choosing to be an executive yeah i think it i think it did i mean i didn't know the depths and i didn't know the the amount of layers the extra layers that go into the ha- you know, the making of a song and the actual music industry. I didn't know there were other things that you could do within the industry that wasn't just performing. Do you know what I mean? So it did affect me in a way that I kind of learned that songwriting, these little things that I was tinkering around with at home, actually were a thing. You know, you could turn it into a tangible thing that was worth something, you know, that was precious. And, And it had the ability to make an impact on somebody else's life do you know what I mean because even on the course you would you know really look into like the lyrics and you would really look into the instrumentation and the the composition of a record that you know when you're listening on the radio you're just like oh yeah I like that like you don't really you don't overthink as to why you really like a song you're just like oh yeah I like that lyric or I like that melody and that's it you sing along and don't think about it but I think when I started doing the course you actually look at the anatomy of a song and what it's made up of and then how it affects other people and how you can affect somebody's mood by what you write or what you play or, you know, and then we, I think it was one day we broke down and we had to, one of the assignments was we had to take this Madonna record um, and we had to break it down and recreate it. So we had to, you know, play all the instruments, record it, do the vocal, but make it sound like Madonna. So then you had to look at you know, try and figure out what effects they might have used on the vocal, what they might have used on the guitar. Do you know what I mean? And then you think, wow, there's so much that actually goes into this one song. Then it made me appreciate the song more. And then, so then later on in life, when I was like creating my own music, it, it really made me pay attention to every single detail. And then, yeah, so I think, yeah, definitely the the course and what I learned on the course definitely helped me in terms of looking at songwriting and creating songs in a different way. Writing at home over those sections that don't have melody and lyric over it so you can write your songs, that's a good a good way to write, but not necessarily a good way to show everyone the songs that you're writing at home. No. When did you feel like you had first written a song and what was it called? I think it was, there was a song, it wasn't recorded very well, but it was called I Can Be. And I think I was like 13. And I think the lyric was, I can be anything I want to be. And it was like, I can be this, I could be that. And it was like this thing that I was like singing to myself when I was like 12. And I was like, I can be anything I want to be. You know, it was so lame. But at the time I was like, yeah, 
This is my um, debut. <laughs> it's my debut single, mum. <laughs> I mean, it's in the living room. Don't you kind of want to say thank you to that kid, though? <laughs> I mean, that kid really kind of, you know, had this ambition, obviously, because the first thing that you wrote about was ambition. Definitely. You know, Definitely. like you were, you were on a trajectory from an early point that you knew you could do things, you know? It was kind of like, I think, you know, that early on, I had this confidence that I kind of like found from not being confident, if you know what I mean. So my mum threw me into a situation with other kids where I, you know, had to kind of like build relationships and get a bit more confident. But then, you know, you go through phases as we all still do, you know, where you feel like, really confident to not confident to, oh my God, I'm the best songwriter. Oh my gosh, I'm terrible. Like I need to get a new job. Like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? <laughs> Part-time job. Still, oh my gosh. You still have that? <laughs> yes, definitely. And I think, do you know, even not to even look at it as a negative, because I think it's that, that up and down, do you know, in a, in a healthy way that ke- kind of like keeps you on your toes and makes you want to keep doing better. Do you know what I mean? So, um, you know, obviously there's massive highs, massive lows within it, but it kind of like keeps it keeps it all fresh, if you know what I mean, and you keeps you hungry for it as well. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a good thing. How is it that your songs at home? You know, what's the transition from writing songs at home alone to these tracks to actually collaborating with artists or? you know, being in a recording studio, Mm -hmm. what is the transition from, you know, thinking this is is something that you're doing alone to Mm -hmm. this is no longer something that you're doing alone? It came from a place of like, I think it was really my mum, really, because it's one of those things like, I'm not really from a musical background as, as it were in terms of like none of my family are in the business or have been you know, writers or artists. But it's one of the things like my mum was always trying to help me figure out how to get into the industry or do whatever I wanted to do. Um, And then being from Manchester, a smaller city, there wasn't really, there isn't really that community and that network of people who are in the industry. There isn't really an industry in Manchester. Um, So it was, I think, going to college, doing music tech, and then meeting other people who were interested in the same things as I was doing. And then I've just always known that um, London really was, out of the UK, was one of the central hubs for music. So then I kind of like had it in my head, like, how am I going to get to London? So when as I was growing up like as a teenager and stuff I always knew London was super expensive so I was thinking right I'm on my music tech course where how am I going to get closer to London because I can't really afford to live in London but how am I going to do this so then at the end of my music tech course there was like this top-up degree so you could go to a college choose a university sorry where you could do like a top-up degree to change your um, diploma into a degree so at the time I was a bit like I don't really want to do a degree. I just kind of like want to get my part-time job in my clothes shop and, you know, get nice garbs and (laughs) just start my life sort of thing. But then I realised that you could do a top-up degree in Buckinghamshire, which is, um, and the campus was in High Wycombe, which was 40 minutes from London. So I was like, right, this is my plan. I'm going to go and get accommodation near the university And then I'm going to do that course two days a week. And then the rest of the time I can commute to London. (laughs) So pretty much I chose that course to do a top-up degree, not because I wanted to do the degree, but just so I could get accommodation that was close to London. And so from that, networked, met people on my course, on the university course, and they would introduce me to different producers and stuff who they knew. I was like, just introduce me to any producer or writer or artist that you know. And then um, a friend of mine, Leslie, introduced me to some DJ producers called Roll Deep and um, yeah and then I started doing I would my days off from uni I would go and do sessions with them and that's how I kind of like got into it Um, just by working with anybody that I knew that could do music (laughs) your first your first deal is with Windswept which is a right is that right that's your first that was yeah 
that was it whilst I was at college. It was always a really cool publisher because it was a, it was a, you know, it wasn't universal and it wasn't Warner Chapel, but it was, you know, the U S equivalent sort of pulse and, Ah. and stuff like that you know some really you know it's a really strong publishing company mm-hmm. did you have cuts before you got this publishing deal or they no. just heard you and were like this potential there's potential here yeah. let's do this deal it's so crazy because whilst i was doing my music tech course in manchester at city college um couple of days a week there was a guy called simon aldridge and he came to our college and he did like a talk on the music business. So he was, he came from London and he was this guy, he was coming to Manchester to do this talk. So it was a big thing. So I was like, cool. And me and all my friends went down to this talk and, you know, and this guy was talking to us and talking to us about the labels he's worked for and and all of this stuff. And then afterwards, I approached him at the end of the talk because he was like saying, you know, anybody's got any questions, you know, come and hit me up and, you know, I'm going to be hanging out for a little bit. So I, yeah, approached him and um, asked him if I could send him some stuff. And I sent him some, you know, rough demos that I had recorded at college. And, yeah, and then from there, he invited me to you know to meet some other people and producers in london so then whilst i was at uni 40 minutes away from london he introduced me to some other producers and stuff and then i started doing my first writing sessions there and i got those off the back of the demos that i had recorded at college these really rough rough demos and so that's how and then and then he started working at Windswept and that's how I got my first publishing deal. It was like a development sort of deal. I had not many songs, but yeah, he kind of like would put me in sessions and yeah, those demos were the first ones that I produced there and then started meeting people in the industry. Did people try to put you in, you know, if you grew up listening to reggae and I don't know what the first songs you started writing were, obviously if you're working with DJs to begin with, there's some leeway as to what kind of music you can do with DJs. Um, Did you, were you ever put into, Oh, well this, this person writes reggae music or this person writes a certain kind of music. Yeah. Did you find that there was, um, I don't know. Was there ever, I don't know if pigeonholding is a word when you haven't really defined somebody's career, yeah. but were people trying to define what kind of music you wrote before you really knew what you were doing? Definitely, definitely. And I feel like it it was crazy because, you know, I, you know, as a young black female from Manchester, you know, that's known for house music and indie music in Manchester. But then, you know, obviously my roots and my granddad's got the reggae music store, you know, but then I was, I was absolutely in love with pop music, you know, and as, you know, as a black female, young girl, I didn't have that big diva voice, you know, that everybody expected me to have, you know, they saw a young black girl and they thought, okay, cool, she's in music, she must be able to sing all these big gospel songs but I've got got kind of like a really baby voice it was more like I would listen to like a Britney or a Kylie and be like oh yeah I can sing songs like that but you know it was just so confusing because and so conflicting because when I was like you know singing on records and doing the artist thing for a little bit it was like people are pulling you in one direction saying oh young black girl you're supposed to be singing either reggae or big soul records but then really I was like actually I feel like you know maybe today I feel like doing like a Britney kind of song or whatever but it's like definitely pigeonholing was like a massive thing and I think it was kind of like it was kind of like I was battling with the industry and then battling with myself as well because people are trying to put you in this box but I'm like no but I like this music I like this music I like that you know and I like loads of different types of music but um yeah, it's, it, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, I've had to really fight against and been like, no, I don't just want to do that. I don't just want to do that. You know, I'm into pop music or rap music or reggae, you know, so, but there was so much pigeonholing. And then it was like on record, people would be like, oh, she sounds like a, a Britney or something. But then when people saw me, they were like, oh, right, we weren't expecting that. So then you're kind of like being dragged and pulled and people telling you to do one thing, but really you want to do this thing. So that's why even as an artist, it was kind of 
I realised that was quite early on that I didn't really want to be an artist. One, I was too shy. Two, I like so many different genre of mu- genres of music. Three, don't really love singing on record. <laughs> I like singing in the shower and singing in the room. Like if I'm with, with in the studio, I can sing along and be like, oh, what do you think of this idea? Dooby dooby doo, boo boo boo, or whatever. <laughs> but then to stand on stage and be like, this is me. Like, I don't want to do that. So yeah, songwriting turned to be my dream. <laughs> I mean, there's a few years there where you're releasing your own music before yeah. you kind of, you know, which already just the idea. I, we had this conversation with Jody Gerson, who runs Universal yeah. Publishing, who I'm sure it's you're close to, you know, and, and we were talking about um, women that are writers that people all, of us, you know, naturally just try to push women writers into being artists, yes. you know, which is a different thing than a lot of guys. You, it's like, I want to be a songwriter. They're like, okay, cool. That's fine. And a woman who says, I want to be a songwriter. It's like, okay, cool. We should make an album with you as the singer. Why is that? I don't know. It's just like, and then you just, I'm just, I'm not sure. It's just like people just, I just really don't know what it is. It's just like, you just, uh, people just assume that that's just what you want to do. And then you get, you kind of like get put on this train and you're just kind of like, okay, because people are telling me I want to do this. Maybe I need to run with it. Do you know what I mean? Just to try and get the opportunities as well. Do you know what I mean? It's like if as a woman just turning up and saying, you just want to be a songwriter, it's kind of like not enough. It's kind of like, no, well, prove yourself. What else can you do? What else can you do? It's almost like you have to have about 10 more strings to your bow before somebody kind of like would take you serious, do you know? And I think, I mean, obviously now it's, it's, it's changing a little bit, but I still feel like it is still a little bit like that. What was it that, that made people start seeing you as a songwriter and not as an artist? I think what it was is even when I was when I first started off writing with like uh, writing for and with um, like rappers at first, first of all, I would like write hooks and then they would be like, cool, we'll write a chorus. We'll do the raps, you do the chorus. And then I was like, okay, cool. I've got this idea for a chorus. Okay. I suppose I have to sing it because I'm the only girl in the room. So cool. So I ended up singing a few. And then there was a time when I would kind of come up with ideas or suggestions for lines for some of the rappers um, and some of the ideas, they would be like, oh, that's a, not sure about that. But then a few of the ideas, they would be like, oh, actually, that's really cool. And then they would incorporate it into their bars and it would sound pretty good. So then I kind of like, kind of slowly got into writing there. And some of my suggestions were actually taken serious. But obviously, if I was to rap them and, you know, in my Mancunian accent as a female saying all these gangster lyrics, it would be really weird. But then some of them, they would like be like, oh, actually, maybe I'll try that one and like incorporate it into their own bars. And then, you know, I think it was kind of like taken a bit more serious. And then I would be like trying to slowly help them a bit more, you know, and then my suggestions were taken a bit more serious. So it was cool. Yeah, it seems like... There is a a period where you start going from, you know, they, you're looking at your discography that you're an yeah, artist, yeah. and there's 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 some time between that and when you're a writer. Yeah. What do you do in London to survive during what it seems to be about four or five years yeah. of being a, an aspiring songwriter versus being mm-hmm. somebody who's really starting to write songs people know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, you know, because to be quite honest, it wasn't really a thing that, you know, the, I didn't know many songwriters when I came to London at first, you know, and especially in the scene that I was operating in, like, you know, with rappers and stuff, it wasn't really looked 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 upon, do you know what I mean? It's, it was kind of, like, strange. So I didn't really have anybody around me who was kind of doing it if you know what I mean do it you know I didn't know many songwriters and if I did it was only people who I'd heard about in like maybe America or something you know like the Esther Deans and you know the Sears and and people like that um so I think I think I think 
during those years where there's a bit of a gap, it was kind of like where I was kind of like battling with, I don't really want to be, I don't really want to be an artist, but I really want to get my songs heard. So I was kind of like battling and then getting dragged and pulled in different directions. Oh yeah, you do pop. Oh, that's going to be a cool angle. A black girl who does pop music. Oh no, but you're supposed to do this. No, you should do reggae music. So I spent, kind of like spent a few years just battling, being confused and trying to find my own voice as it were. Um, and then from there, I kind of like would, it was just kind of like a lot of network and I was working in a bar, you know, I was working in nightclubs in bars and stuff because, you know, trying to operate in the music industry, but then not having an income, you know, it's like, what are you going to do? Do you know, my parents like would pay my rent for how, however long, but they, they never told me to get a real job or anything. They were all like, keep your eye on the prize, keep your eye on the prize. And if we have to keep paying your rent for you, then it's fine. You know, they're, they're not super rich or anything, but they just supported me whilst I was in London and just kind of like believed in the whole dream. But, it, you know, it's, it's super hard, you know, especially being in such a huge city and it's so expensive. So I would like work in part-time in a bar or in a nightclub, finish at like five in the morning and then try and go to sessions at like that started at like midday and I'd do that like every day sort of thing, just hoping to, but I loved, I actually loved it, you know, just creating music. And then it kind of like helped me to love music as well because I didn't have to rely on music to make money you know because I already had my part-time job and as long as, and my parents had already said that they'll help me with my rent on the months that I couldn't. So then I was able to just throw myself into music for the love of it, you know, because I wasn't trying to worry about money. Um, so those that was kind of what it was. I was just trying to survive in London for all those years, pretty much. Um, yeah. I mean, those are really good parents. Uh, it's, <laughs> um, you know, the real shift, it, you know, a lot of times you try to tell people who are songwriters that, your job is to also be an entrepreneur. Nobody's waiting to cut your songs. Nobody wants to cut your songs. You know, artists have other things to do. They also Definitely. want to go to a bar. They don't want to be in a studio. Definitely. It's hard to explain to people that nobody wants to cut your song. Nobody wants to admit that, but nobody wants to cut your song. <laughs> it's you know, so true. It's just, it, I don't care who you are. It, nobody wants to cut your song. And <laughs> it, so you have to create opportunities. Yes, the big change, obviously, is, you know, you're an artist, you're an artist, you're putting out music. Mm -hmm. And then the first thing that comes out where it's, you know, there's sort of a slew of songs that come out. But it starts with Jess Glynn, mm -hmm. who really blows up because of the relationship you guys created. Mm -hmm. It seems like you guys, your careers end up being hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Um can you explain how you met Jess and what the process was to going from, you know, you're an artist and then here's somebody that you're collaborating with. She's now the artist and then everything seems to start to click. Yeah, it was actually super crazy because I had spent all these years, as it were, like working part time in a bar and trying to collaborate with loads of different um, artists and, you know, rappers and, and just trying to be in the scene sort of thing and be part of the industry. Um, so when I was doing stuff with these rappers and, you know, we released a few things um, with Roll Deep, um, there was a college in East London who had heard some of the music that I had co-written for um, some of the rappers in the UK. And they were inviting different, different writers and different creatives into onto the course to talk about their story so it's just as you know so they invited me and they were like cool we know that you're unmanaged you're unpublished you don't have a record label but we've known that you've featured on a couple of records and you've been you know collaborating with some of these um rappers and it was in east london that this college was based and the rappers who I'd been working with were also from East London. So it was pretty much, they were just reaching out to people who were part of their scene. So whilst I was on the course, um, you know, I was just talking about being kind of like, just trying to wing it and get myself through the industry and network and collaborate. And at the end of the course, um, yeah, a student approached me and was like, you know, I'd love to 
send you some stuff. And um, the student was Jess Glynn, so she was on the course. And so she sent me um, a link to some of her music and um, it was a SoundCloud link. And I remember listening to it and being like, wow, you've got a really good voice. And I thought to myself, wow, you sound so much like Natasha Bedingfield. Do you remember Natasha Bedingfield? And I thought she had such the same tone. And I was like, wow, you've got such a strong voice. And, you know, this, you, you know, small, slim, like, red-headed girl just was like oh hi yeah Do you know and she was kind of like came into the cl- um into the class into the talk really late as well sat at the back kind of like moody but then approached me at the end as I was walking out and then um, from there you know she was working part-time as well for this drinks company like selling like Jägermeister that I was working part-time in a bar and any free time we had we would just meet up in this studio um in London and in this basement and we would just like listen to music and write and just hang out really and we just did that and then at the time she she spoke to me and she was like oh do you know I really want to um she was toying with a few opportunities she was like oh do you know this producer's hit me up and wants me to be in this girl group and this other one has told me that I should do an EP and you know and at the time I was like oh I don't know I don't know what you should do but you know your voice is huge I'm not sure I don't have anything set up but you know I really do think you know I believe in you and stuff I'm not sure what the plan is yet but I don't think you should be in a girl group and I, and I don't think you should just put your own in, um, EP out independently so we we're just like trying to think of ideas and at the time I had um, collaborated with just before that I collaborated with this rapper called Michael Payne and I you know he had fe- we'd done this, this collaboration record he was rapping I was singing and we did a show together and it was this independent publisher came down to um his independent publisher came down to see the show and um he introduced me to the owner and we we spoke and stuff and then i told them about um jess glynn and um they offered me like a jv you know just cut to a long story short they offered me a jv and whilst i was on the course i learned about publishing companies and stuff so i started this tiny jv with books and then we put in an offer to sign jess glenn <laughs> that was going to be my first person that i was going to sign and then it, it was crazy you know because i wasn't like really set up or anything at the time but i knew that you know i really wanted to work with her i thought she had potential but just didn't have a team behind me so then what happened was um put in this offer you know just it was a big offer to me but you know in real terms it most probably wasn't uh, for a, a huge deal um and then off the back of that her lawyer introduced her to another publisher and they came in and blew my deal out of the water so and they offered i think 10 times more and i was like oh my gosh and then the lawyer was like well if you can match this deal then we'd be able to go with you. And so I went back to this, you know, new relationship that I built with this publisher. And I was like, come on, you know, can we just push it up a little bit? And they weren't able to. So then off the back of that, she ended up signing to this other publisher. So I was like, oh gosh, you know, so sad sort of thing. But then, you know, off the back of that, she, you know, then got a manager, got a record deal and all of that. And then they called me in, the team called me in and said, you know, the work that you've done with Jess and all the songs that you've done with Jess, you know, has helped her put her package together and that's enabled her to go off and get a record deal and, you know, now she's got a big team and stuff and we'd love for you to just to keep writing together. She absolutely loves working with you. So we ended up just writing pretty much the majority of everything together. So to get to sign her, but then we've, you know, literally all this week I've been in with her again, working on a third album. So, yeah, it's absolutely incredible. Um and kudos to her team and to her for recognizing Definitely. what got her in that position. I think yeah. more often than not, especially the careers where you guys were at, yeah. when a young person develops another <laughs> ar- artist or a, yeah. not necessarily a young person, but somebody who doesn't have the credits develops a, yes, another yeah. not credited artist and that artist gets a deal the label and the managers almost all of a sudden say, okay, well, let's see how big of a co-writer we can put them with. Yes. Or how big of a producer. Yes. You know, that's really unusual for, yeah. that's how it's supposed to happen. Yeah. Is a recognition of the work you guys were doing. Did of any course. of the songs you wrote before the deal become any of the songs that we know now? 
Well, there was some that became, um, there was a couple on her first album that, you know, became like soft releases and they ended up on the first album that, you know, went to number one and stuff. Um, But they were written before, you know, the deal. Um, And they ended up staying on the album. But then, yeah, it has been a massive journey and there have has been some battles as well but you know to be quite honest it's it's testament to to jess actually as well because she's always been fighting for the fact of no 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 we're going to do this together we're going to do it together because there has been times you know obviously when uh, you know opportunities that do come up and i'm like hey you know you'd be silly not to do that and she's like no i want you to be in there with me i want you to be in there with me you know um which is you know and obviously as a new artist you know she's in a new situation new deal new team um you know scared of rocking the boat but then kind of like stuck to her guns as well so as you say our our careers have gone in tandem but she has also fought for that to you know to remain that relationship as well and then obviously you know you do have to keep delivering as well you know but we have got a really amazing relationship and as you say it is uncommon sometimes to you know not be just kicked to the side. <laughs> she, she's, had, she's had a lot of success in the US, but there's a different level to what she means in, in the UK. Yes. Um, you know, and it, it seemed to, it's an interesting thing when an artist becomes so massive in a certain region and, yes. and is not, it, it's not that it's a matter of not success, it's mm-hmm. massive success in the US. But she's so much more successful in the UK. Yes. What is it that? What's the difference between a hit song in the UK and one in the US? Why is it that certain artists are so much bigger on one side? It's crazy, isn't it? I think it's just because I think we we although the UK is kind of you know a lot of people know UK music, we are still just a tiny little island compared to the US. You know, there's just less people, less. Do you know what I mean? So. Uh, a, a hit in the states is wow! It just blows it out of the water for for the UK. But then UK is obviously being our my hometown and stuff. It it means you know the world to have success here. You know, starting here as well. Um, but yeah, it's so so different. And actually, the culture's different. The industry's different. Do you know the way that we consume music's different? Do you know, and obviously. Um, you know, we have the big stars that come out of the UK as well that translate. But sometimes, like, the, the there's this, especially with rap music, there's this kind of, like, language barrier because the slang's different. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, you can have right. people like Drake coming over and then he'll say, you know, he'll pick up some of the UK slang and say stuff like mandem and stuff. <laughs> and then everyone's like, oh, okay, cool. But do you know what I mean? It's like, it's different, you know. I think just the, the culture's different sometimes. Do you think now, because of having worked with Jess, it's almost the exact other side of the spectrum than reggae? I mean, she has some, like, some of the rhythm <laughs> are, are, it couldn't be further from. It's so far away. You know, do you find that it's now hard to get into some of the other rooms that you were initially put into? Mm-hmm. Not, do you know what? To be quite honest, it's one of those things that I have to kind of always be aware of because I never kind of like want to be pigeonholed too much. You know, I will go from, you know, there's 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 a few artists that I kind of like focus on their project. So I'll get like so Jax Jones, I like focus on his his project. You know, and we do multiple records together then there's like ray who i do a lot of you know she's a newer artist but um an amazing songwriter um as well so i'll do a lot on her project and then there's the jesses but then i try and keep it actively i try and keep moving in between genres as well you know so i'll do like the sean pauls and the the whiz kids at afrobeat um and then i'll do you know like yeba and um, you know just keep it keep it keep it moving trying to keep it a bit fluid and then i'll you know go back to back to my roots as it were and try and do some reggae bits or some rap bits and stuff but i think as a songwriter you do have to kind of like plan and you know have kind of like a game plan as to not get pigeonholed as well jack jones is one of the other ones that you have a long now you have a lot of songs yes and and same with 
you know, Jess, where you have that you you're able to develop these relationships with artists where mm-hmm. most writers I think end up doing, you know, a session with this artist or a session mm-hmm. with that artist or a session with this writer. But you go in and do full albums. <laughs> um or you go in and you do you keep coming back or they keep coming back to you. Yeah. What is it that creates that kind of relationship that's a little bit deeper than one offs? Mm. I think what it was is um I'm super aware of it as well. I'm a bit like, it's like when we did the, we did a song together, Jax Jones, myself and Ray. So I had worked with Jax Jones and Ray separately and they're both signed to the same label and they've got the same A&R, but um, they'd never worked together. So then I had a session that was coming up with Jax Jones and then the A&R, um, you know, you know, it organized a session. Uh, and then I was like, and then he, then because Ray is on the same label and we needed a vocalist as well, it was suggested, let's all just do it together. So we did that session. We came up with a song called You Don't Know Me, which was you know pretty successful here in the UK. Um, and then, you know, we, you know, we were knocked off number one by, you know, it didn't go to number one, it was number three because Ed Sheeran had come out and he took, brought his album out and number one and number two it's like we were like oh my god oh my god it's going up going up and then all of a sudden Ed Sheeran came out with an album number one number two and we were like oh my gosh but anyway it was still it still did really well and and you know the song that we made in that session was 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 brill and super fun but then it went you know we had this success with this one record and then it was almost like a year and nobody had even suggested for us even to get back in the room and I was pretty much I called the A&R one day and I was like hey, so that song we did, it did pretty well. How's about, would it be crazy if maybe we should get in and do another session? And he's like, oh my God, yeah, of course. That's a brilliant idea. I'm like, um, well, yeah, <laughs> maybe we could try something. But it's so crazy, the amount of people who wouldn't even suggest, you know, get in and do another record maybe, try another day. You know, that went well. But it's even sometimes the obvious sessions that people don't even think of. So I'm always, um, the reason why I like to do a lot of sessions or multiple sessions with one artist is kind of like you get so many more chances to be a bit shit. Do you know what I mean? It's like not every day, not every record you do then has to be amazing. You can, you get multiple chances. It's like auditioning, but you can get another chance and another chance and another chance. So I always tend to just be like, okay, cool. That session went well. Should we put another one in? And then that's so it's happened. And then you just create your kind of like team or you click, you know, so for instance me and ray we just write anyway for other people you know and you know we've done so many other bits together like for like madison beer and you know lo- loads of things that we'll just write together because we've got this chemistry and you know some days we might have quite a few bad days but then even if we have a couple of good days and that's good so yeah that's why i love to do multiple sessions with people <laughs> yeah I, it's a it's so obvious and yet nobody does it it's crazy it's amazing how many times you have a, a song that matters to the artist and they just don't seem to connect the dots. Instead, it's yeah. like, well, who's next or who else can be yes. asked? Yeah. And who's the next hot thing or whatever. It's like, um, even when I worked with, um, so I worked with um, an artist from the, from the US called Yeba. And we did a song called Evergreen did a song called evergreen so we did that that session came about because i was sent um a clip of her sofa sounds and she was coming over to the uk and um you know looking for you know they were putting some sessions together for her so i was suggested to do i was sent this youtube clip and i was like oh my gosh her voice is amazing you know she was unsigned at the time i was like yeah definitely let's get in it was easter so i was supposed to go home to manchester which is three hours away from london to be with my family because um it was easter and then they were like cool but she can only do this weekend so can you work with her i was like okay cool we'll do one day so we went in and i was like absolutely blown away blown away by her so then the next day that we're due to go in i just cancelled my trip to easter and spent it just in london you know just on my own and then we were in the studio and i was absolutely blown away by her you know she's super creative her, her voice is amazing the story's incredible like and absolutely love this song so me george reed a producer and yebba went in did this song evergreen and then yeah we haven't worked together since <laughs> 
but she's amazing and it just so happens that I suppose after that she got signed and then she's done so many amazing collaborations and then people just get busy as well you know so I don't even think with that it was a case of intentional it's just that it's crazy isn't it you do some and that's one of the my favorite songs that I've ever written and you know um but it's crazy isn't it that you just sometimes just don't do multiple sessions but we've hung out like when I went over to New York we hung out and stuff but yeah it's crazy isn't it the obvious sessions you think to do it's obvious it is (laughs) shocking and obviously she's one of the more hyped artists in the last few years you know her deal is obviously massive and there was a lot of people talking about it but um you know i hope they go back to you because that is a good song um the hurt that you get when you when you try to sign someone that you really want to sign and then you don't you don't get them Mm -hmm. luckily you and jess ended up you know becoming collaborators yes you still had this jv Mm -hmm. and it gets you the bug to yes. want to sign people throughout all this your brain is working in both the business side and the creative side mm-hmm. talk a little bit about the journey of the business side from once you tried to sign Jess till now because most writers don't have the scenario you have yeah to be quite honest with with that it's kind of I was super inexperienced you know it was my first thing straight out of university I'd heard about um publishing companies and record labels and setting up your own thing that you know even in hindsight now I know that it was the right thing for Jess to do in terms of having a team around her and the publisher and management and everybody that she has now it was amazing for her and for me as well you know and to have the to have that team and to be able to bring it to the levels that, that, that it has gone to, I wouldn't have been able to do that at that time, you know, on my own as like a one-man band sort of thing. So to be quite honest, it's a massive learning experience. But as you say, it gives you the bug, doesn't it? It gives you the bug. And then, you know, especially as time went on and then having more, you know, do more trips to the States. And then you meet other people, you know, um, like yourself and you know there's the bennies and there's the jenna andrews and that all these people who you meet and then they've got other things going on as well and you're like actually because in the uk they're like oh no no no, you can't do that you can't do that you have to do this and you have to focus on this but then when you go to the places like the states it's like of course you can do it you've got creatives who are a and r's and who've got their own thing and there's you know the evan bogarts and stuff and then you're like oh actually this is is a thing do you know what i mean you hear about you know, companies that have started off from nothing, from scratch, and then, you know, with a bit of a dream and a plan, and it becomes something, you know. So I've been super inspired by when I make these trips to LA and I'm surrounded by other entrepreneurs who are also creatives, you know, and it does actually give you the bug. So it's it's part of it as well as having the confidence and knowing that, you know, actually everything has to start from somewhere. So um, after that situation with Jess... You know, that's why I decided to focus and, you know, try again. And, you know, I was always coming across new writers and people who I admired and saw potential in and wanted to work with and collaborate with. That's why. And then I did my um, JV with Universal called Ginseng, which I've had for a few years now. And it's building. And I just love that idea of being able to start from nothing and then do you know, those tiny wins are absolutely huge. So now, do you know, I've got like new artists, like I've got a new artist called Sophia Amato, who's an amazing singer. Do you know, and you get your first radio play and you literally get, do you know, it's the biggest thing ever. You get your first sync that's tiny or, a, do you know, your song's used in the background somewhere, do you know, for like 15 seconds. And it's like, feels like the biggest win ever. So that's part of why I, I, I still hold on to the fact of developing my own thing as well because those tiny wings wins do you know they, they are absolutely huge still do you know what i mean it just it makes you a, it just makes you a dad or a mom or whatever yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> you're start to have those songs that come out it feels like it's time you know yeah. it really is um building your publishing company is one part but 
you're really multifaceted as an executive. You're working in in our on the label side, and you're working with the Ivor Novellos. Keep explaining those other facets, and also the Ivors in UK are such a big and important award for songwriters, and we just don't have that here. So explain what that is. So it's a trade body, and then they represent um, songwriters and composers. Um, and it's they have different committees. So they have like the songwriters committee, the jazz committee. And, you know, it's been super interesting for me. I've literally only been there, I think, a month. So I'm really, really new. And the Ivan Novellos are this, you know, they ha- hold these prestigious award ceremonies, the Ivers that they have every year. And it was always one of those things that I had looked up to and aspired to attend, you know, when I was, you know, when I first got into music and stuff. And you always hear about it, but you never thought it would be for somebody like me, like a black female, you know. So um, the opportunity came came about to, to um, you know, to to stand to be a board, um, to be on the board. And it was one of the things that my mum was like saying, well, why not? You know, I was super scared to even go f- put myself forward to say I would like to, you know, be part of it because it was all, you know, a lot older, white, middle class, upper class, classical jazz um composers and, and um execs that were all part of it you know so i was actually super scared to even be surrounded or you know i thought to myself well what have i got to even say or offer you know i knew that there was ideas and stuff that reasons why i wanted to be on the board but i just never thought that i would be taken serious if you know what i mean but it was my mum who said to me well why not you know you do represent a huge part of the industry as well you know as a black female and they do need more voices on the board so why why can't you be on the board sort of thing so it is um a super exciting opportunity and you know there's always already some super interesting and important conversations that are being had you know and we we are um tackling at the moment you know even as songwriters and DSPs and the streaming income and stuff, which I know that, you know, obviously you've been um, super active at raising awareness on as well and and lobbying. So, you know, it's early days for me there, but it's something that I definitely feel strongly about and happy to be a part of. Yeah, your mom's right. It's, it's, <laughs> it's really important that the Grammys are a similar thing. It, left to their own devices, it ends up being a bunch of old white guys deciding on what the most relevant albums are and it's just shockingly not uh why people listen to and what Mm -hmm. what's great is so subjective and for it it to happen you know for the for the same old people to decide every year who gets the same award in a fast evolving industry is just Mm-hmm. stupid and you know versus somebody yeah it's crazy five different genres you know who you know grew up listening to not the same music yeah. you know it's so important to have you on that board I, worldwide that's really important too because it does represent songwriters in the biggest uh music economy outside of the u.s yeah. It, it represents us too, just like it would represent, you know, you to have the Grammys do the same thing. So yes. I appreciate that. Um, oh, amazing. You're, uh, as a label executive, you've not taken mm-hmm. on that role too. <laughs> to be a songwriter? Pardon? Do you have any time to be a songwriter? <laughs> to be quite honest, it's been super good. It's not like I'm in the office every day. Well, nobody's in an office anyway, but it's not. Do you know what I mean? It's part of, um, I, I see it as part of my role as a songwriter, you know, because when you're in in sessions and you are with these new new writers and new artists and artists who are on maybe the second or third albums, you are kind of, I, I always put that hat on as well in terms of 
I don't just want to write a song and just be like, okay, cool, leave it to your own devices. I'm, I'm also actively out there thinking, cool, we're in this together. Who else are we going to get to feature on it? Who can produce it? Um, are there any other people who we can add to this um, session? Or, do you know what I mean? So I always feel, felt like I was doing like an A&R role anyway, and I, I really enjoy it. You know, the amount of times when to get your song over the line, I've like, to get my own songs over the line, I've had to, if it was like for a house producer, um, I've suggested maybe the feature or I've called up an artist and be like, hey, would you would you jump on this? Do you know what I mean? And it ends up getting cut and then I'm just like, cool. And then I put the management or the labels together to discuss the business side. But there's so many, oppor- so many times where I'm like, actually, I did this song in that session. Maybe you can feature on it. Do you know, so it's all part of the same thing for me, actually. And it's just, I, f- I feel like as a creative, we're actually in the room with these artists so we can you know we we know how the how they how they operate the music that they're into how they really what the, what their strengths really are in the room do you know what I mean so I feel like as songwriters do you know we kind of do a and r as well absolutely we're going to go to our uh our next segment Five for five. I'm going to list five things and just tell me uh, what comes off the top of your head when you hear these names. Okay. <laughs> Let's start with Jax Jones. Ooh, na na eh. What? I like that. Tell, tell me, tell me, tell me. Do it again. Jax Jones. What What comes to the top of my head? I'm just going to name what's on the top. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, na na eh. I like it. Ray. <laughs> so Ray. Um, sassy Chic. Jess Glenn. Powerful vocals, red hair. I like that. Um, <laughs> we're going to end up doing six, so don't follow me. But your father. Football. Yeah, that's a weird one, actually. I'm not super tight with my dad, but yeah, football. Your mom. Powerhouse, my rock. Finally, your fiance. Love of my life. (laughs) The best. Yeah. Heaven sent. (laughs) <laughs> yeah with my fiance it's it's so crazy because do you know i know it sounds really cheesy do you know you just don't ever think that you would have that opportunity to find that kind of love because i was in like such a before before my fiance about maybe six years ago i came out of a such a heavy relationship that kind of like to be quite honest i think that really helped me and pushed me into focusing on my music even more. Do you know, I kind of like f- focused so hard and kind of like just wanted to shut off. And then any opportunity that would come off, it could come around, like to travel or sessions. I just didn't want to be in, in um, at home. So I would just like always be traveling and stuff and always just trying to find opportunities and a reason not to be at home. So I think that really threw me into work. And I remember it was so, it's pretty sad, um, I was going through such an awful breakup and then I was like a bit scared to be at home alone that um, I remember Jess, Jess was on tour and then it, she was, you know, touring around um, America and Europe and stuff and it was her and all the band and then she had saved me a bed on the bus. So everybody, you know, everybody had a um, a bunk, their own bed, but then I had my own bed as well. <laughs> And it was so crazy. So they used to have to put me down as like a vocal coach or something. Like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm part of the crew. But really, she just knew that I didn't want to stay at home alone. So she couldn't be with me. So she would bring me on tour with her. So it was so cute. Yeah. That's really cute. I went off onto a tangent. But I needed to say that. <laughs> Thank you for doing this uh, all the way where you are. I believe it's uh, now about 6 o'clock, 6.15. Yeah. Um, um, you know, I just, there, again, there aren't that many people who are, who put the health of the industry ahead of themselves at times. And anybody who's on the board of these trade organizations or any of the people who are 
who are looking out for those new artists and those new mm-hmm. writers. Those are the people that are really ushering the next generation of humans in this business of that has a long history of uh, euphemistically complex characters. And, you know, you're, you're helping create a community that's better than the one that that you walked into. And uh, I appreciate that because we just need more people like you in it. So thank you for, for doing this. And uh, I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Ross. Like, honestly, um, it's been such it's such an honour to even be invited to to do it. Because, as I said, I like I listen to. Do you know what I mean? It's a huge thing. Like, and I think it's absolutely incredible. And I actually, I, w- I was even saying to my fiance before, I was like, "Oh my gosh, I don't even think I'm ready." Like, I don't know. <laughs> and he was like, "It's fine, it's fine." <laughs> but yeah, actually, yeah, thank you so much. It's been an absolute honour to 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 be on here with you and talk so thank you as well and thank you for everything that you're doing as well for the industry honestly it's like so inspirational and so good to see and um you're definitely building a massive community and people all over the world as well and bringing us all together so i feel i, I truly feel honored to to be part of that Thanks. Thanks for listening to this episode of And The Writer Is. If you want to hear music from this songwriter I just interviewed, be sure to check out our Spotify playlist or visit our website at andthewriteris.com. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe to us. You can also like us on Facebook and Twitter. And The Writer Is is produced by Joe London, edited by Miles Bergsma, and published by Big Deal Music. A special thanks to David Silverstein from Mega House Music and Michael White. Until next time, this is Ross Golan.